Are You Real, episode 75. Welcome to Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You, the podcast that focuses on Christians that are active in everyday life. Join in as we speak to everyone from successful business owners to educators to athletes about their faith and how it helps them reach out and revolutionize those around them to do the same. And now, get ready to roar with your host, the voice of manifestation, John Fuller. Hey, Roar Nation, don't forget... February 9th, 2018, we are having our second annual growth conference hosted by Jody Holland, my friend, who will be putting it on. It will start Friday at 9 a.m. and go to 4.30 p.m. We have over 10 speakers who are going to bring you life-changing uh, man, just everything. I don't even know what to say. It's going to be awesome because we're going to be talking about uh, building your income, building your confidence, balancing your life, uh, purpose, passions, possibility, all that stuff. So jump on our website, uh, check it out. We'll have a link to the growth, uh, growth, if I could pronounce it right, growth conference 2018. And also um, for the first five people who send me an email, I'm going to give them a free book of mine, DIY, Remodel Your Life. Uh, We had a lot of requests for the other books, but we only had a couple to give away for each author. Uh, We had quite a few people ask. So if you'll send me an email, I will be happy to send you a free book, but you got to send me your info. So anyways, log on, go to our contact page, send me an email, and I hope you love today's episode. Blessings. Hey, Roar Nation, coming at you live from my new home in Amarillo, Texas, temporary till I get my new office set up. But I am, uh, I'm just telling you guys that because I'm blabbing on. So anyways... I'm really excited. Somebody on my staff found another awesome woman author speaker uh, for you ladies out there. We've had requests, which I feel like we're hitting home runs because we've had several in a row, which I'm excited about. So my office, um, somebody on my team reached out to a lady by the name of Rebecca Lyons. And we're going to just jump into it today. We don't know a whole lot about each other uh, yet, uh, but we're going to sure find out because I'm excited. I've read her About Me page. And uh, so, Rebecca, are you fired up and ready to roar? Yes. Absolutely. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. So, guys, check this out. Rebecca is an author. She's a speaker. She's a mom of uh, three, a husband of one. uh, A wife. A wife. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) I'm on a roll. (laughs) A uh, wife of one, uh, dog walker of two living in Nashville. Um, I love what you said in your, in your uh, bio. It says you're an old soul with a contemporary honest voice who puts on a new face on a struggling, uh, struggles women's face as they seek to live a life of meaning. Mm. I love that. And I want to dive mm. more into that because that's what we're all about is um, authenticity and finding purpose. So Rebecca, dive in. Let's just dive right into it. Tell me more about you. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, thanks to whoever on your team found me. That's really kind. Jameson. Uh, Love this. Uh, Quick backstory, I guess, is, goodness, I have, yeah, I have three kids, 16, 14, and 12. So they're teens right now. And, you know, we're going rogue. Uh, my, My oldest, Cade, has Down syndrome. And so at 26, the day he was born, you can imagine that changed the trajectory of what I thought motherhood would look like. That was my entree. Uh, And my faith got loud at that point. You know, I grew up in the church and and even had lots of conversations about calling and purpose and mission. But I think the way I've learned about calling in these last few years, the way I teach about it often in colleges is that calling is where your talents and your burdens collide. And Talents are those birthright gifts that are given to you in the womb by God in Psalm 139 when he knits you and he crafts you with such intention and he has destiny over your life. Uh, but when that pairs with the burden, which is the the story that you were born into, the family you were born into, the, the road you've walked, and it's defined by the things that broke your heart. Um, I didn't know then, but <laughs> you fast forward uh, about 10 years later, we moved to New York City. And in the first two years of being there, I developed panic disorder. And I thought I was going to New York with three kids, two toy poodles and a minivan, which isn't cool <laughs> anywhere, but yeah. particular, particularly when you're pulling into Manhattan. And at the time, my kids were nine, seven and four. 
And I was ending that, you know, decade, that proverbial decade of diapers and Cheerios and poop. And I was not sad about it. And I remember my daughter entering kindergarten and I'm skipping around Manhattan thinking I'm pursuing this, this midlife reset, this life of meaning. And I, instead I found surrender. And I can tell you today that meaning follows surrender. Sometimes we want a life of meaning, but we're unwilling to give up the life we're currently living. And so we're kind of finding ourselves in this middle space that's barely good enough or just enough. And, uh, so New York just threw me into a tailspin. It was, I wrote this in my first book called free fall to fly. And it was, a, you know, it was basically where I chronicled <laughs> this crash and burn, uh, for about a two year season of coming to the end of myself as a firstborn type A control freak, high capacity performer, uh, found myself unraveling. And then when my faith really came alive in that season, the Lord kind of walked me into a journey of healing. And so, and so I'm having this mental health thing and, um, my, when you, my, I'm going to ask you questions as you talk, okay. because you're, yeah. to be honest with you, you're dropping some really good stuff. Um, <laughs> but I want to be totally transparent because I, I believe that's what we're called to. So you talk about mental stuff. Are you struggling with like depression? I mean, things, but because I think, all of us struggle with it. And I know my wife has because we have three kids almost the exact same ages. So I get mm. it. Um, mm-hmm. Dive into that a little bit because that that's a hard one. Be- and, I, and I feel like especially in church, because if I was to go to the altar and say, hey, I'm struggling with depression. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody just wants to, if, if I'm in a, I go to a charismatic church, not overly okay. charismatic, but they just want to lay hands on me and cast out a demon. Well, that's mm-hmm. great, but that doesn't always work. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think for so long, mental health was shamed in the church uh, or silent and you can't heal what's hidden. Right. So everyone would bear this burden alone and they would never really feel like like a a relief or a rescue because uh, it it was always told that they lacked faith. And um, it is true that for two years, those first two years in the city. Now, again, this is seven to six years ago. So okay. this is kind of that first season of going to New York. Um, when the panic attacks were happening all the time in planes, trains, elevators, subways, and crowds, you know, I couldn't avoid it. I mean, everywhere I'd go, I was gripped in fear. And remarkably, my life verse was always, I've not given you a spirit of fear, Rebecca. I've given you power, yes. love, love, and a sound mind. That's a good one. And so I had to kind of pull this, extrapolate this scripture because the King James says sound mind. And here I am operating with crazy brain. And I'm thinking, okay, the, if this isn't something you give me, and anxiety had become my fancy word for fear, then, then where is this coming from? And why is this so gripping and crippling? And around that time, I was reading the work of Viktor Frankl, and he very much, his, he's a Holocaust survivor. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning in the 40s. And, you know, he's dead now, but I love books by dead people. I think there's just remarkable stuff there that cuts through the noise of today. And so he basically said that the, um, the root of anxiety is unfulfilled responsibility, and which means, you know, you're made for something, calling back to that destiny in the womb, but you're, you're not doing it. And, and there's this sense of fear of purposelessness or lostness or soul searchingness, or even this existential crisis that so many of us have midlife. And I remember in that season of New York, that, that was when I was in the, 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 the grips of trying to like, who am I? What am I doing with this second half of life? Or and how old are you when you're do, going through this? Well, at this time, I'm 37, okay. 38. Yeah, so not old. I'm, no, I'm you're not, not. No, you're not old at all. Yeah. I mean, you're just kind of coming into you, to be honest. These are great right. questions to be asking. Right. And I've always, again, been an old soul. So I probably asked him a little sooner than I needed to. <laughs> but that was just where I was. I had matured a ton, you know, in my 20s because of some loss. And so you just grow up really quick. And and then as a result, you're just asking some larger questions of life from a 30,000 foot view, probably um, in advance. <laughs> but all that to say, when I cried out for rescue after a year and a half of this, one night in the middle of the night at three in the morning, I just said, rescue me, deliver me. It was the middle of a panic attack, like, like so many nights before. And in that moment, my body broke on the bed and all was still. And I didn't have words for this. I grew up Baptist. I don't understand. I don't understand the weight of God's glory. That looks like a healing balm in a way that changes your life. And I remember walking out of my apartment the next day and going, is something different 
because I remember the night before being covered in such a piece, I couldn't even move. You know I, I just Real quick, I want to say this, and I love you said you grew up Baptist. The, the thing is, though, is obviously theologically you couldn't explain it, but you couldn't deny it, correct? Because it was correct. so radically transforming. Like, it was real. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think that's what's so awesome about the spirit of the living God, right? It doesn't yes. matter what someone puts on you in the church, whether they try to, you know, pray the demon out or or um, explain to you why you don't have the gift of tongues or, you know, try to get you to try to manipulate something. I mean, when God wants to do something, he's going to do it regardless Amen. of what, what man tries to kind of establish prior. And I think he had an appointed moment where he wanted to show me what rescue looked like. And I, after the fact, I read Psalm 18 and it's the real Psalm of, of David where he says, you reached out from on, you know, you heard my cry from your temple, you heard my cry and you reached down from on high and you pulled me out of a pit and you rescued me because you delighted in me. And I remember crying reading that like, wow, is this really what this feels like? I've never known this. I accepted Christ at five. I've learned a lot of verses. I've kind of gone through the motions, but I never experienced the power of a transforming God. Um, And that changed everything. I mean, it really did. Um, But back to mental health, I do think we have to be very careful in how we approach this. I remember initially people going, well, that's not fair. Like, why would God heal you and not me? And I'm like, well, just so you know, healing looks interesting to me six years later, <laughs> seven years later. Um, it doesn't change the fact that if I'm trapped in an elevator, I'm going to probably feel panic within 30 seconds. Um, in fact, that happened in February, right before my second book came out, the day prior to this book I just wrote on freedom. And I'm like, of course, of course. But um, I just think sometimes we can focus on the things that are coming against us, or we can focus on the fact that he always makes a way of escape. I don't think that God promises that the trials aren't going to come or that there's not going to be uh, things that are trying to like threaten your g- kind of calling and your purpose and what you're made to do. But God says, I'll be your ever present help in any time of trouble. And so I'm learning now to what is, what is reaching to him quicker look like? What is trusting him? What is me pausing my own responses and just sitting and waiting for him for relief look like? So that's, that's been kind of this new season, um, of, of walking in a way of mental health by putting practices in place, but also kind of being still and knowing that he's God and that he, he is his, he's Jehovah Rapha. So it is in his nature to be healer. And I trust that I can rest in that. You made a comment earlier. Um, and I, I didn't catch all of it. I tried to write it down as you said it, but you were in a season when you went to New York, New York, man, I'm tongue tied today, dude. I'm going to mm-hmm. roll. Called you. I even called you a, a husband. Um, <laughs> That's great. So you talked about a life of surrender versus a life of purpose. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't have nailed it better because I think you're like 75 or 76 interviews now. And people have asked me, what is the one common thread that you see that over all these interviews? And and I've interviewed people, you know, in the world's eyes, uh, great and small. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, the one thing, including in my life is surrender. And and I think people view it as like this really bad thing because like almost as we're giving up something. But what I found all through scriptures, you can't show me anywhere where anybody ever gave up anything and didn't get something a hundred times better in return. Mm-hmm. And I would love for you to dive in to your experience of of coming into purpose through surrender. Mm. Well. You know, when you talk about the kingdom, it's if you lose your life, you find it and the first will be last. And it's it, Jesus is always speaking in reverse of whatever the world is, t- the narrative the world's telling us. And even the poor in spirit, they inherit the kingdom. I just I love that we are really agents of ushering in the kingdom. Like once we claim Christ, our calling and purpose really is some expression of doing that through our gifting and our wiring and our heart and our passions. And when everything kind of comes in full alignment under that surrender, we get to be that upside down kingdom. We get to kind of look at those who might be overlooked or abandoned um, by the world. And we get to be champions for that. And so 
surrender to me meant once this healing journey began, it meant my life's not my own now. It, it never was, but <laughs> finally I am aware of that. And I've been bought with a price and I've been by Christ. I've been given freedom to walk a new way, to be life and light, to be a city on a hill, to be, you know, kind of one who encourages and champions other people. So, you know, that's why this book on freedom was so powerful for me because freedom's not for us. It's, it's always meant to be given away and that's how it grows. And so, um, surrender, my surrender prayer kind of in this season was Lord, don't show me too far in advance. I don't need like, a, I don't need a three-year plan. I don't, really don't even need a one-year plan unless my calendar shows me that I've committed to doing something. I said, I'd rather just show me each morning where to go, what to say, who to encounter, and the words to give that person, um, and be open to the interruption. And that has opened up so many amazing ways of relationship and ministry. Uh, and there's something really sweet in when God said, just initiate nothing and watch what I can do. Uh, because I did, I just there was a season of stillness where I've kind of felt like hidden, you know, in that secret place. But what God was really pouring in, in that life, he's like, I I actually am going to accomplish everything that I have declared over your life. I'm faithful and I will do it. (laughs) And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. And we think we have to muster up all this energy and marketing and um, promotion to make sure that that we help him along the way. And this is not to say that you don't like strategy is my number one gift. So you can imagine in the strengths finder. Yeah, that would be hard. Right? Surrender <laughs> in that area would be hard because naturally you're going to do that. But then also at the same time, you have to learn how to lay that down at the appropriate time. Yes. Yes. You know, I think he does, you know, he gives us the steps, but he, but he also kind of makes the path clear. And so part of it's like, You give him your offering and then he's the one who breaks it and blesses it and multiplies it. And you don't have to worry about what the outcome may be. If you know before him, you gave your everything and it it came from a place of obedience. And like you said, surrender, that posture of surrender, then, then you're good with whatever, what is the, whatever the outcome looks like. Um, you made the comment about kingdom which I love because most people don't understand that. I want to ask you, and what does kingdom look like to you in, in what you teach uh, on stage? Well, I have found in my few trips to Israel and learning more about when Jesus talked about the poor in spirit, even in that day from this rabbinical guy that kind of shepherded me and really gave me, um, you know, just kind of context. And he said the poor in spirit in that time would have been those who were just struggling with something physical, emotional, mental, uh, sick, physical, you know, like this idea that they, there was a lack there in them and that society might look down on them or they might look down on themselves. And so of course I think of my son Cade, right? You know, 92% of people who have a diagnosis of Down syndrome in the womb will will terminate. So that means Cade's a lucky one, right? You know, 92% of Down syndrome kids aren't alive right now. Um, only 8%, wow. only 8% actually made it into the womb, into the world. That's powerful. Right? Um, because again, man has determined what a life is worth. <laughs> and, and I don't say that out of judgment. It's just the truth. It's just, that's the real, that's the way it is. Um, so I'd advocate for that. Obviously it's part of my story and that's my burden, right? You know, you think of the things that make you cry or weep at night and you use the gifts of communication or I guess that's my gift or writing. Um, I'm going to, you use those gifts to redeem the things that break your heart. So I'm going to be an advocate for that or mental health for sure is part of my story. And so that's my burden. Um, my father, I watched him have his first breakdown when I was in high school and he's kind of walked a road of different kinds of chronic depression, mild and also bipolar. And now he's older with Parkinson's. So, you know, I'm bookended by two men who have had to struggle with this. So this is a burden I carry. So I, I see all that as poor in spirit. Um, And so I really do, I think my call and my assignment, and I think we all have to wrestle with God on what is this? What is our specific message and voice 
going to be that doesn't need to look like anyone else's. And that's okay. Um, it's going to be distinct because he's that creative and ima- his imagination is that vast. So for me, I have, it's taken a while. <laughs> I've only been doing this, honestly, speaking and writing for four years. So I'm kind of a late bloomer, but I believe that the upside down kingdom for me and who I'm the Lord sending me to, I'm finding this kind of theme or pattern is when Jesus says, I don't come for the healthy, I come for the sick. And I think he's saying, I'm sending you to the sick. I actually want you to be the one who sees the ones other people aren't looking at or hearing what's not being said or seeing behind the eyes and kind of pressing in. Um, And so I find that I do minister a lot to people who are struggling with mental health or people who are physically sick. And they're just like, looking for prayer. And I think God um, has given me enough stories to grow my faith for this area of healing um, in ways we can see and in ways we can't see, but to trust that, you know, in his nature, that that's what he's about. And so that's been really, um, I think we all have a little way of bringing in the kingdom of ushering that in when we are operating under his power uh, and so for me, that's just kind of what this has looked like for the last couple of years. I love your answer. I want to bring up um, when you're talking about kingdom and you said you're a late bloomer and uh, I've, I've always thought the same thing too about myself, but the more I think about it, I don't think we, anybody blooms late. They bloom on time. Right. Uh, and that being said though, what moment or where were you at where you talked about, you feel like you're called to uh, the sick and those things you kind of had to have a moment where it started to become more clear to you. I'm assuming Um, I I did. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because what I want our listeners to grasp is when you talked about gifts and talents, you know, one of the things that we say is your place of pain is your place of rain. And I I want to, and I think you and I are talking the same terminology, just a little different. I would love for you to hit on that. Um, where you started kind of had that aha moment, like, Hey, this is what I'm supposed to do. Because I think so many people don't realize they're right in the middle of that struggle. They're just not recognizing it. Mm, Yeah. So I wrote up, there's a quote in my latest book where I just, the Lord one day just said, Rebecca, the, the measure of trial you've endured directly relates to the measure of hope you offer the world. And And so you could live in this place of trial. And even when it comes back, right? I mean, the enemy doesn't sleep. (laughs) He's not like going to fade out on the job. In fact, we become more of a target because he's, he's like, wait a minute. She's like actually bringing a message that's contrary. So everything I've tried to throw against her is only strengthening her, but yet he keeps trying. (laughs) So I understand, uh, like what warfare feels like now more than I ever have, but, but regarding this idea of um, of of how did I know kind of where my sweet spot was, where the kind of the tip of the arrow, the bullseye, is I f- I found that my message was resonating in the in the desperate places because that's where my faith came alive is when I went to New York. I mean, I, I grew up in the South and lived in the belt buckle of the Bible belt in Atlanta for 13 years. And I had created quote unquote, a pretty comfortable life in Christianville. And, and then I go to New York, no one knows or cares who I am. Everyone doesn't even buy the, the Jesus story yet. There's a curiosity there that is sparked when you are bringing a message of hope and, um, that's not about man-made solutions. It's actually something beyond that. And so I found that my message was resonating with people in desperate places and it didn't feel like it was resonating in people who were kind of very, very knowledgeable in the church. And, you know, and, and so, and so one night I'll never forget I remember because I was so new and so green about this. And I just felt like the Lord just kept saying, like, press into healing in my in my quiet time in my prayers. He kept saying, press into healing. There is more for them. There is more for them. And so one night, I'll never forget. I think I was in Jersey. And I said, hey, guys, um, if anyone wants healing, like for anything, and I, I kind of said, I mean, I'm not promising anything. And I'm like, <laughs> disclaimer. I'm I know I'm sheepish. I'm a little skeptical, but I just felt like the Lord's like press in, press in for more. I said, I'd love to lay hands and pray and we'll just stay here all night for whoever. 
And it was like two hours, like 200 women like waited in line. And I'll never forget the last woman in line was the pastor's wife. And at the end, she's like, nobody actually has just given me permission without just, you know, assumption. I think some people are skeptical of the, the arrogance of assumption, but yet we also, God says, no, you, you're not responsible for the healing, but you are for the asking. And so like, let's do this. And so just by giving permission for that, for that kind of like cry out to be heard, that desperation to be heard, women started sharing from the womb. Like they would say, I've been, I've been afraid my whole life. I've had anxiety since I was four. I was abused this way. I've had trauma this way. I've had unresolved. And there's just tears flowed and flowed and flowed and flowed. And I was like, okay, Lord, I mean, if this is here, I am, send me, if this is what you want, this is where I'll go. Um, and so it's been quite, quite an amazing journey. That's powerful. I love what you said. Um, it's not a response, but obviously we just need to ask whether God does it or not. I, I have okay. no idea. That, that's always been uh, kind of my motto or my deal is like, I can't explain tongues or all the gifts or all those things. Like some people mm-hmm. believe in them, some don't. Like, I'm just like, all I know is I was at church and it showed up. I can't explain mm-hmm. it, but I, but I experienced the power of God. Mm-hmm. And he's freaking awesome, and you need some mm-hmm. of it. <laughs> you need right. some of it, right? Right. So, right. Um, okay. So, for the sake of time, um, I'm going to uh, hit on a couple quick questions. What do you feel like your biggest strength is? I think, I think it's faith. Currently, I mean, and I, I hesitate to say that because I think it's under attack all the time. But I, I think the Lord's given me faith. Um, And he's given me language to talk about it, to make it feel approachable uh, for people. Um, A lot of people aren't sure what they think about God or even what they think about Jesus or even Christianity. But everyone kind of is interested in this idea of faith because it means that you are releasing your own control over everything in your life. And you're open to you're open to this outer beautiful force of who we would call God, you know, that that created us. And you're kind of like, the way I'm doing this isn't quite working out. And I really am interested in more. I want to hear more about this journey of faith that you've been on. And it's been, it's been beautiful to be able to just talk about in that in a way that just says, Hey, let's, let's go there. And so the faith that God's given me, and then even the context to share it, that doesn't make it sound weird. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So also within that, what do you feel like your biggest weakness is? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I'm a four on the Enneagram. I hate to even say it. (laughs) So there's a lot, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram, but the four is the individualist and they need to be unique and they are very introspective and introverted and, uh, very artistic. And so I tend to because I journal every morning and I think sometimes that introspection can kind of turn dark. If you're not careful, uh, you, you ask for the spirit to give you conviction and, you know, but then sometimes you're like, wow, you become your worst critic. And, and so I think that could be a weakness sometimes if you don't actually, uh, pour that reflection into the right places and, and make it positive, like learn from mistakes and then encourage people with it. Don't just dwell on it. I would say that was probably one of my, one of my stronger weaknesses. Okay. If you had the opportunity, um, you remember back to the future. So if you get to go back in the DeLorean and you get to go back to the younger you, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What advice in what age, what age would you pick? What advice would you give yourself? But you're not going to change anything in the future. Everything's still going to happen, but you're basically going to go give yourself a pep talk. Mm-hmm. what would you tell yourself? You know, I would tell myself, I, I'd speak to college students all the time. And, and part of it is just like, don't stress out so much at your age about getting this calling and purpose thing nailed because the Lord is like, it's already planned. It's already planned. It's already confirmed. Basically just walk, do the next right thing. Like walk in obedience to whatever you're prompted to do. Um, and, and work hard. Absolutely. You know, have a work ethic. That's always a good thing, but don't stress about the outcome 
it's been so sweet to see in, you know, 20 years since I, we got married, my husband and I, how each season was the exact right season before the next one. It was exactly what we needed to be prepared for the next thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. And we could have never 20 years ago said, this is what our life's going to look like in 20 years. But we did know that in that day we live fully, like to be fully present in the moment that we were given for that day and walking in, walking it out in obedience and faithfulness. And then it just all kind of snowballs from there. I got to write that down. That's really good. Be fully present. Uh, in the moment of the day that we've been given given. Mm. So that's really good. Um, okay. As we wrap up, uh, Rebecca, tell me a little bit, uh, how our listeners, uh, can find you, uh, about your speaking, your book, all that stuff. Kind of give me a rundown of basically how we find you and what you're all about. Sure. I, I think the easiest way is just Rebecca com, And my name is spelled different. It's R E B E K A H. L-Y-O-N-S dot com. So, and then there would be a calendar with speaking schedule. The two books, You Are Free is the latest one, Be Who You Already Are. Uh, that came out February of this year. And then Free Fall to Fly was the first one from three and a half years ago. So, yeah. And then I do a lot of free online studies, like video series, because I love, I love video. And I love to just kind of do these little nuggets that we offer for free to people. So this summer I did one on rest. I just finished one this fall on strength. And, um, you can access those anytime on my website as well. And those are absolutely free and it's just kind of a fun way to connect. Love it, man. We're going to have to check it out. What is one last piece of parting advice that you would like to give our listeners? Oh, that's good. You know, don't take yourself so seriously, like have fun, have fun in this adventure of life and purpose and calling, you know, some days are going to feel like a weight and then, and then God quickly reminds us like, Hey, my yoke is easy and light. And so if I call you to it and I'm in it, I'll make it feel light. It doesn't mean there won't be days that are hard, but, but in general, there's a joy. It's the actual joy of the Lord. That's our strength. And so no matter what the struggles look like, I always go back to that. I'm always saying, restore to me the joy of my salvation. It's the joy of the Lord is my strength. So give me, give me laughter and, and dance parties in the kitchen and bring people around put people around you in life to work alongside that make you happy, that make you laugh. Um, I think that's a real key thing to kind of stay in, in this race that we're running. Absolutely. I love it. All right, Rebecca, hold on just a second. We, just, we close up. Roar Nation, thank you uh, guys and gals for jumping in. I love having you. I hope this really blessed you about finding purpose uh, just dealing with struggle and just realizing sometimes our greatest struggle is the thing that we're called to, to conquer, uh, also to bless others. Uh, because God has given you uh, what exactly what Rebecca said, not a spirit of fear, but of peace, love, and a sound mind. So go out and kick some butt today. And uh, please don't forget to rate and review us in iTunes. Check out the website, areyoureal.org. We'll have all of Rebecca's uh, contacts and links on our site. And uh, we love you. And just remember, be real, be authentic, and be you. God bless. That's all for this episode of Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. Be sure to go to areyoureal.org for your free questionnaire to identify your gifts and talents and how you can use them to help people become leaders and catapult them into their destiny to help others become the leaders of tomorrow. We appreciate you spending your time with us and look forward to helping you reach out and revolutionize next time on Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You.